I'm excited now to introduce our, our two breakout sessions that will be starting in just a few minutes, as soon as you can get there. In the first breakout session, we will have Dolly Manadak, a clinical bioethicist, bioethicist and youth engagement strategy lead here at Holland Blurview, moderating a discussion on reimagining the possibilities of inclusive play, infrastructure and programming. So I encourage you to check out these breakout panel sessions and to do so you're going to go to the navigation menu on the left side of your screen and click on the panel that you'd like to listen to. All right, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for waiting for me. <laughs> I really do appreciate that. Um, my name is Dolly Menedek and I'm the bioethicist at Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. I know you are enjoying the 17th annual Blurview Research Institute Symposium, and I thank you for joining us in this breakout session and waiting for me. Um, our session, Reimagining the Possibilities of Inclusive Play Infrastructure and Programming. This breakout session will focus on a panel discussion with three authors of the recently released report which is called Creating Inclusive Playgrounds, a playbook of considerations and strategies. This report offers comprehensive guidance to municipalities and community groups for creating inclusive playgrounds. For easy access to the playbook, you can scan this QR code with the device um, that you have and the camera. Playgrounds are important to children's health development and overall well being. Yet many playgrounds are still inaccessible for children and adults with disabilities, creating exclusionary experiences that are deeply problematic. The considerations and strategies presented in this report go beyond the borders of playground design by covering topics such as community engagement, play programming, playground surroundings, service and maintenance, and even more. The considerations and strategies have emerged primarily from an international environmental scan of practice-oriented materials concerning inclusive playgrounds. The playbook is structured around four key questions that you can see here on the right hand of the screen. It's now my pleasure to tell you a very little bit about each of our panelists today. Kelly is an Associate Professor of Disability and Physical Activity within the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Toronto. She leads the ADAPT Lab, which focuses on developing and testing theory-based physical activity interventions that reach individuals from marginalized groups with a particular focus on persons living with disabilities. Kelly is also an adjunct scientist at the Blurview Research Institute former co-director of Knowledge Translation for Active Living Alliance for Canadians with Disabilities and a co-investigator for the Canadian Disability Participation Project, an alliance of university, public, private, and government sector partners working together to enhance community participation amongst Canadians with disabilities. Jennifer is the director of the Stedward Center for Personal and Physical Achievement, which is a teaching and research center within the Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. The Stedward Center is a leader in adapted physical activity and para-sport development, and on an annual basis, serves more than a thousand children and trains more than 250 students. Jennifer is also former co-director of Knowledge Translation for the Active Living Alliance for Canadians with Disability, a member of the leadership team for the Inclusive Sport and Recreation Collective in Alberta, and a collaborator with the Canadian Disability Participation Project. Tim is a scientist at the Blurview Research Institute at Hall and Blurview. He leads the EPIC Lab which conducts research focused on understanding experiences of childhood disability and advancing more inclusive communities. Tim is also a registered professional planner and an assistant professor uh, status with the Department of Geography and Planning and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Toronto. And 
As I said, these were just a few of the details available about our panelists. If you'd like to learn more about their work, you can scan the QR codes on the screen. I will put this slide up again at the end of our panel as well. Now, let's hear from our panelists how they are reimagining the possibilities of inclusive play, infrastructure, and programming. And Tim, I'm wondering if I can ask you to set some context for our panel by helping us to understand what is ableism in play? Sure, um, I can address that. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with ableism. Uh, ableism can be understood as a set of beliefs, uh, processes, and practices that are unfortunately informed by a profoundly normalized, uh, are unfortunately informed by profoundly normalized values that prioritize an idealized type of human being, a uh, type of human being that is in fact hyper-normative, a type of human being that is unfortunately discounting a great deal of uh, the, the diversity of the human condition. And so this ableist idealized human type produces favoritism for certain abilities and a disregard for, uh, or even negative sentiment toward those who do not have these abilities. And so in relation to play, I'll, I'll note that by asking who does and does not get to play in relation to play opportunities, so playgrounds, video games, <laughs> board games, um, and, and so on, uh, one will likely quickly observe the presence and persistence of ableism play. So how have we for decades built playgrounds that have inaccessible sand and pea gravel surfaces that signal to kids who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices and their families that the play opportunities here are not for them? Uh, you know, I, I urge you to think about your own community playgrounds and the accessibility of their surfaces and the equipment. And how is it so that when I saw a comment from David uh, in the chat, that when trying to create accessible playgrounds, uh, we, we've at times incorporated a single accessible piece of play infrastructure, meaning that those living with disability have one choice while others have, you know, dozens. You know, and, and, and how long did it take for video game systems to start creating accessible controllers and settings? So although play is still you know, arguably rife with ableism, we're making notable progress, um, especially in relation to playgrounds. And I think that's extremely important and necessary. Uh, and I say this because uh, addressing ableism in play can contribute to broader institutional and societal changes, which are really challenging. So I, I, I'll just note, uh, consider if disabled children are present on playgrounds that are consistently designed to be accessible and inclusive. This means non-disabled children and disabled children will come to expect uh, the presence and diversity of disability in their communities. And this knowledge and experience can carry forward into adulthood um, and, and, and help those non-disabled and disabled children, now adults, to question ableism in other realms. So education, employment, healthcare, and so on. It can help to unsettle the normalcy of disabilities exclusion. So while creating accessible and inclusive play opportunities doesn't guarantee this change, it, it, it seems like a, a pretty good step uh, in the right direction in terms of helping children to learn about disability, ableism, inclusion early on. I'll stop there. I probably went on yeah. too long. You know, Tim, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. I, you know, I really, that last piece for, for me is truly interesting for us to reflect on um, and hopefully our our audience members will do that as well. So that message that children are getting at a very early early age about exclusion, what would it be like if that early message was inclusion and participation and value yeah. to everyone in the community, right? It's uh, really um, thought provoking to consider what kind of change that might lead to. Mm -hmm. And so if we consider that question, I'd love to ask the panelists, What's one recommendation to improve the design of playgrounds? What would that be? And, and why do you think that would be the recommendation you'd want to give? Sure. Kelly or Jen, would you like to <laughs> chime in? I, I could jump in first. Um, I mean, Tim alluded to it before in terms of around surfacing. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to let Tim decide, go in that, that area. But 
Um, a lot of the work that our team has collectively been doing, um, we've been, uh, we published actually a scoping review, identifying evidence and form recommendations on in de designing inclusive playgrounds. I think one of the key recommendations, and I think this really sits at the heart of the work that, that Holland Blue Review does in terms of user involvement and really in incorporating more of the voice of children with disabilities into those play spaces. Um, we oftentimes maybe more rely on the parents. So how can we, uh, with design, how can we better um, engage children with disabilities in, in that, that whole process? I think that's really critical. Um, it's one thing for us to, to, to think what we think what they should look like and what parents think what they should look like, but kids know what they want. And we just don't hear enough from children with disabilities. Thank you for that, Kelly. It's true, right? Kids, I feel like they're always ready to tell us. Are we ready to listen is the question. <laughs> Jen, would you like to add? Sure. Actually, when I was thinking about this question over the weekend, my first thought goes right to the actual design features. And I thought, oh, definitely playground surfacing. That's most important. And then I thought, whoa, whoa, like we need to back it up. And so to echo Kelly's comments, it's really about um, prioritizing accessibility at the initial design stage that like we need to really make that the priority in terms of every playground design and by starting at the very beginning then that will have the ripple effects so then accessing some of the resources that we've been involved in creating or reaching out to the community and the kids to find out what they want but if it's not a priority for the community they're not going to take those steps so i think that's the number one design recommendation is to prioritize access and inclusion and making sure that it's a priority to all community members because we don't want to just put the labor on the families of kids with disabilities that it should be all parents you know on the parent council saying well why is our new playground not accessible we all believe that all kids should be on the playground so really starting from the very beginning by prioritizing access and inclusion mm -hmm. thank you john um tim would you like to add i would like to add yes maybe something about surface <laughs> sure i could speak to that but i, I will note if if i were to make one you know, pick one recommendation. I, I'm I'm very much aligned with Kelly and and Jen on this to uh, get accessibility and inclusion acknowledged at the outset of the planning and design process, and to really advance our community engagement processes. Having said that, I I might also recommend that uh, designers and planners, as they go through this process, we need to really step back and question the scope of what a planning project is. Um, or, or what a playground project is, because what's happened is oftentimes when we're creating these playgrounds, so much emphasis is focused on the accessibility of the the playground, its its surface, its equipment that we kind of forget about, you know, extending the scope to the surrounding environment. Um, the fact is, people do not magically show up on a playground. There is a transition to and from the playground that has to occur. And that sometimes can be laborious for families living with disabilities. So we need to be mindful to ensure, um, you know, an adequate number of uh, accessible parking spaces, especially given the use of this, this playground, um, being mindful of the pathways, um, advancing, uh, trying, trying to create the necessary amenities and facilities that a community might want in the surroundings and making sure that disability groups and families living with disability uh, have voice in this. You know, the example we've used in, in, in another talk actually was, um, you know, if, if a child living with disability requires an accessible washroom while visiting a playground, um, that that may very well, if, if we don't have those surrounding facilities, that can end a, a playground trip full stop. And that doesn't seem like the greatest reason to have to stop a playground visit. So I, I hope that we can start creating better facilities, picnicking areas, um, and so on around playgrounds. Thank you, Tim. Can I, can I just jump in there a little bit with, with Tim? Like, um, you know, maybe I jotted down my notes ahead of time and something I wrote was like this interaction with design and quality of participation. And I think it really speaks to what you're saying, Tim um, and Jen mentioned as well is, you know, it's, um, oftentimes it's thinking about going beyond the minimum with the minimum number of parking spaces. We talked about that in one of our, our team discussions of um, you know, people want to know what, what do I need to do at least? Well, what can you do more of? Like have more accessible parking spaces, an example. Um, but I think of yeah. um, it's not just designers, it's the whole community, but thinking about 
the quality of, of one's experience in these playgrounds. And it's that whole journey, getting to the playground and coming from the playground, it really needs to be thought of in, in design. Thank you, Agreed. Kelly. 100%. And, yeah, and Jen and Tim, I have to, you know, you saying that also, you know, makes me think even about an experience recently, I was at a conference, uh, like a separate conference center, and they had more than, they had hundreds of parking. I It was very far out in the middle of nowhere. So that's how they had so many parking spaces. I counted five wheelchair accessible parking spaces. And of course they were the only ones close to the door and they were filled up before even half the parking lot was. So I think you're right. You know, if we are considering what families are navigating to leave the house, to go somewhere, to get there, to park, to get out. Um, it's like an adventure. Um, and there are many steps to that, that adventure that impact a person's ability um, to be there, belong, or stay. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if we can also talk a bit about play programming. Could you could you tell us about the play programming research that you're doing and what sort of programming possibilities you envision for playgrounds in the future? I can start a little bit. Um, so at the Steadward Center, we were really fortunate to be involved in doing some programming um, on an accessible, inclusive playground here in Edmonton. So Canadian Tire Jumpstart has been investing in communities across Canada. And there was um, an in accessible, inclusive playground in kind of the northeast corner of Edmonton. So in two summers ago, Steadward Centre had an opportunity to deliver some programming. And so we tried to create some programming that would work for families. We wanted to keep it... Um, sort of structured to meet the needs of the group that showed up at the time. We made it drop-in programming so that it wasn't dependent on families having to commit to being there at a certain day and time, but that created some interesting challenges for the, for the staff who were programming because they had to be available to respond to whatever kids showed up that day. So they were out there a couple of days a week at different times of the day, um, and they really had a range of, of activities for kids that really utilized the unique aspects of the the equipment. So they created some activities that were tailored um, for those accessible features so that kids learned about what those pieces of equipment did and how they worked so that they could become more familiar with the unique features. They also really focused on entry to play. Um, that's a really unique feature, I think, for kids with disabilities. They don't always know how to gain entry into activities happening within our, our playgrounds and play spaces. They're not always sure how to ask to join a game or to read the social cues where maybe it's okay for them to join in, but they're, they have less experience or they lack those skills to know that they can just dive in. So in, introducing activities that really gave those kids a chance to start to build those social skills was really important. So those were two of the key features I think that our staff were building in. And then they really tried to create um, a resource that, that folks could then take and use it at any playground. So we do have a, pre, a playground, a Steadward Center Program Play Guide, so many Ps, um, that is available through, through our website. So if folks want some suggested activities that can be done on playgrounds, thinking also that not everyone has a fully inclusive playground, so what else can be done off the equipment? Um, so that is one resource that's been developed by Steadward Center and is absolutely available for folks to kind of foster that entry to play piece. So I'll kind of leave it, I'll leave it there for now. Great. Thank you, Jen. And maybe I can encourage um, everyone to take a look at those QR codes again at the very end to have some access to those websites. Thank you. Um, Kelly or Tim? Yeah, I'll uh, jump in after Jen there. And I, I really, um, I've learned a lot with Jen and her team in terms of the, that aspect of entry into play. And I think it's something even all of us need to be more mindful coming I'll say out of the pandemic, we're still in a pandemic, but just, you know, a lot of children, regardless of whether or not they're being diagnosed with disability, are, are struggling in terms of making friends, being part of play. And um, I think what Jen and her team have been doing around, you know, just these uh, social skills and, and practice on the playground goes a long way beyond just children with disabilities. Um, I think it's, when we have this conversation about programming on playgrounds, some people think, why? Like, you go to a playground to just play. Why are you all of a sudden doing programming on a playground? Um, well, A, we have been forced a lot more to be outdoors and be creative in terms of how, you know, our programming couldn't be indoors in terms of concerns, obviously, with pandemic. Um, but also B, uh, while we are seeing an increase in terms of 
playgrounds that are uh, designed for not only accessibility, but also inclusion, they're not enough. Um, and so what we are hearing from some communities where, is that they are finding that these inclusive playgrounds, like for example, Earl Blail's playgrounds, it's a Canadian Tire Jumpstart Charity's playground, it's packed. There's so many kids out there. Um, and for some children, that can be very um, anxiety provoking, you know, going on the playground where there's hundreds of kids literally running on this 15,000 square foot playground. And some conversations we have with municipalities in terms of maybe having designated times for programming or, you know, certain, just allowing certain kids, um, age groups, whatnot, play that maybe more, more safely. So I just want to highlight that because some people may question why, why programming? Um, but uh, in terms of some other work that uh, we've been doing, Jenna and I and our teams have been working on creating what's called a quality participation blueprint uh, on playgrounds. So this work really stemmed from uh, work that uh, Jenna and I have been part of the Canadian Disability Participation Project, which is also linked to that QR code in the end. Um, and there's these blueprints that have been created for facilitating quality participation in, in sport and physical activity programs. And so our teams really thought, well, here's an opportunity of taking this concept of quality participation, thinking around enhancing people's sense of autonomy, belongingness, challenge, et cetera, um, and using a, strategies to support one or more of what we say, these, these building blocks, for example, autonomy. So uh, from some of the existing or original playground uh, research we've been doing, we have conversations with families and ch children and parents of the playgrounds that they have in their communities that are specifically Canadian Jumpstart uh, playgrounds, we've been able to identify some strategies that align with one or more of these uh, quality participation features. And so our hope is uh, that we can have a blueprint uh, that will be available for programmers. So those of you who are camp programmers, let's say, um, but also educators and even parents of some strategies that they can support their child on playground. So it may not just be a program. It may be that being a parent, here's an opportunity to perhaps, you know, assist your child in a fun way uh, on skills on the playground. So that's kind of where we're at with some of the work. So that resource is not yet available. We're in the still its development stage and doing some pilot work through surveys with parents and, and programmers. Thank you, Kelly. Tim, would you like to add? Yeah, I'll chime in briefly. Um, I'll, I'll, I'd just like to know one project that we're uh, carrying out right now is just in the data collection stage. I'm, I'm working with a, a really sharp student, Shalane Cedrus, who, who's doing a poster. So of course, stop by and, and see her if you're interested. Uh, where Shalane's looking at, uh, we're, we're carrying out a study focused on understanding the accessible playground programming needs and desires of families living with a uh, child with disability, as well as professionals in healthcare and education. Um, and the aim is to produce and share well-informed recommendations for developing playground programming options that will enhance play, educational, and clinical experiences on the playground. So, um, you know, we, we want to understand how occupational therapists, physiotherapists, therape therapeutic recreation specialists, um, as well as educators, you know, what their ideas are, what they need from a playground to use it as, as part of their work so that we might advance the designs of playgrounds going forward to, to better facilitate and support that programming layer, okay, so that we can leverage this, this infrastructure um, even further. So, uh, early days, but we're we're jazzed up about this study. Yeah, and really, that seems to make sense, right? If kids can be enjoying themselves, why not leverage that space and that structure in order to practice skills, in order to do some activities that might be called therapy, but if they're fun, maybe they would be called something else. Maybe they would be <laughs> playground time. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um. I, I really wonder, um, you know, it, we, we're talking about so many things here and really it's uplifting to think about all of these steps forward. Um, and I wonder just, can we talk a bit more about how we can create more inclusive play opportunities in our communities that we all exist in, that we live in, that we, you know, um, travel in, that we stop by in, that we work in, and that we want to play in. 
what are what are some of those ways we can create more inclusive play opportunities? I I could start if, uh, if that's all right. Uh, so I think I mean what we just spoke about is is one really great opportunities to to advance more inclusive play opportunities to really start pushing and thinking more about programming opportunities for these these playgrounds. But uh, I'll I'll mention. I think it'd be interesting and exciting and and great for communities if we might question how we're putting boundaries on children's play and all, you know, maybe we can break down the boundaries of playgrounds and start incorporating accessible and inclusive play components into the pedestrian realm, into school zones around schoolyards. Maybe that could even advance active school travel um, and so on. So I, I think there's opportunity to create play equipment along our, our sidewalks, underneath storefront windows, play walls, et cetera, uh, that it, it just seems like a really exciting opportunity because I don't think children necessarily need to or, or, or should have their play constrained to those specific spaces. I, I think it could help to address the adultism that persists in so many uh, of, of our community environments. So it's, we're not, there yet with our, our research, but I, I think that's a kind of fun direction to go in. Yeah. Yeah. What it what an interesting thought, right? To be able to play while you're while you're out with your family doing errands, right? Instead of mm -hmm. it being, you know, dragged along by the hand or <laughs> pushed along or, you know, being told, okay, drive safe, let's go, that there be ways to engage. Yeah, um, absolutely ways that uh really well maybe adults would play too right i was gonna say maybe the kids would really love but i know as an adult i still have to say that i i enjoy i enjoy play dates right why is it that adults have to hang out but kids get to have play dates <laughs> which one sounds like more fun right uh kelly and jen can i can i ask you to to share with us as well what are your thoughts for how we can create more inclusive play opportunities in our communities Sure. So thinking about, first of all, Tim, I really appreciate your answer. I never would have thought of that. So I love learning from, from our collaborative work. That's such a cool idea. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of creating more inclusive communities in general. So kind of stepping back to think about if we want families to see themselves on the playground, or if we want families to see themselves in, in play programs, they need to see themselves. So when we're advertising programming opportunities, we need to ensure that kids with disabilities are represented and families too, because obviously, you know, children with disabilities grow up and hopefully they become parents with disabilities. So really thinking about that representation and who is welcome and who belongs in our communities. Um, here in Edmonton, we have this really neat community league system where every neighborhood kind of has their own community league and plans lots of really cool programming. And so I see those as being really incredible opportunities for them to show the rest of the community that we value, you know, our neighbors with disabilities, we want them to be involved in our community activities. So again, simple things like, you know, if a school is having a parent council meeting, including in the messaging things like, let us know what your access needs are to participate, letting folks with disabilities know that they're welcome to participate and not putting the labor on them to have to say, hey, is this event going to be accessible? I don't know if we can attend really making it clear that they're welcome. And then hopefully then families will then feel included. Also includes things like um, advertising inclusive birthday party spaces. There's a really neat story of a family that started using the Canadian Tire Jumpstart Playground here in Edmonton. And one of the kids um, has a disability, they ended up hosting their playground there. And then the recreation center realized, whoa, this is a really unique opportunity. And they're now looking into how can we let families experiencing disability know that this is a really great playground, um, sorry, birthday party space for them to be able to have those social experiences. So by, you know, welcoming folks with disabilities into the community, it sort of has that ripple effect where hopefully it includes more social opportunities. So really broadening that scope of what does play mean and really trying to let all folks with disabilities know that they're welcome in our communities. Thank you, Jen. Really seems to speak to, to me, hopefully I'm Hopefully I'm getting it, but it really seems to speak to me about that user experience and, and feeling like you belong and that and that everyone's able to live life to their fullest. Really, thank you. Kelly, how about you? Well, I've run out of ideas. They've taken all the great ones, <laughs> but I also love, I mean, Tim, you shared that 
that uh, thought before and I, and I love it. And I do think adults love to play and adults need to learn how to play more. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, just with, with Jen's comment, it, it just made me think in terms of even around, um, you know, it's not enough to say, okay, we have one accessible playground or accessible space in our community. We're doing such a great job we need to lobby in terms of funding. I know funding is hard, uh, especially right now, uh, but, uh, but I think we need to be creative and our spaces need to be accessible and not, and what does it mean to say the space is accessible? So I think that needs to be really spelled out for families, and individuals, when you use that term accessible, is it because there's one accessible swing that's noted earlier or what's more than that? And for something to be accessible versus something being inclusive, I think those are two different terms too. So, I mean, that inclusiveness around sense of belonging, what's being done in your space, um, indoors or outdoors, to enhance that sense of belonging, especially for individuals who experience disability. Not to bring it back to programming, but I am going to bring it back to programming. I really think it's important to think about our, our leaders, our play leaders, um, and really treating them the same as coaches. Many of you may be familiar, some of you are certified with our NCCP, our National Coaching Certification Program. Um, how about play leaders? Um, and when I use that term play leaders, I'm thinking in terms of like camp, camp counselors. Um, some, some communities do have play leaders where they educate families what's on the playground, for example, but I think some training needs to be there. And uh, and what can be part of that training, I'm not exactly sure yet. I think some of the resources we're developing could be considered. I know high, I think high five is a good example, but we really need to, I think, do a better job in thinking about training um, because it's not just the high, le high performance level should that should get all the training focus. Thank you, Kelly. Maybe, sorry, if I can just piggyback. Kelly just reminded me that I should have been putting in a plug for our inclusive play leadership resource. So it is an online training module that we've been developing over the years and it is available. Um, it's through the Canadian Tire Jumpstart website. And um, if you, I believe my QR code should probably link to that resource as well. The information is available on our Stedward Center website. So I'll just put in a little plug for that, that it's a great um, kind of intro to inclusive play. It can be done in about 90 minutes and it's available for, um, you know, folks in high school, but also young adults, people who are new to the workforce or who are just looking to gain some knowledge and information around delivering inclusive play programming. So thank you for the reminder, Kelly. And Jen, maybe I'll just ask you, so if I'm an audience member watching today and I were to scan your QR code, hopefully it's going to take me to the right link. I did test it. So yes, <laughs> it should take you to the right link. Um, does that mean I could just look through and I could I could do the module? Yes, in order to do the module, you end up going, so Canadian Tire Jumpstart has a suite of resources available for training, and this one is included in the suite of resources. So you do have to create a login. I think there's a nominal fee, I think it's $15. Um, so there's a few little steps that you have to go through, but if somebody wanted information about how to do that or how to navigate that, please reach out and I'm happy to provide a bit more information um, about how to get through to things. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, you know, I, I really feel as though we have, you know, a topic that we could spend all day talking about, right? There's so much joy when we think about play. Um, and so I'm going to ask a really, a really tough question, if that's all right with the panelists. So here you go. Here, here it is. This is the tough one. If you could decide what the one message or lesson you'd like our audience to take away from from our time together today, what's that one thing that you would want us all to leave here with? What's that, what would be that one thing you want us to know? And I will just ask all three of you to think about that and to share with us when you're ready. Jen or Kelly, do you want to start? Kelly, you mentioned we nicked answers from you, so I don't. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think my hope is that anybody who's listening to this session comes away with, with a deeper appreciation of uh, one, the importance of, you know, playgrounds and play um, uh, and, 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 you know, how, how they are truly 
remarkably important childhood spaces. Um, and that's, you know, any ableism that's persisting within the design services systems associated with these playgrounds really needs to be addressed. Um, and, and to do that, I hope they recognize the externalities of advancing inclusion. I mentioned earlier how that inclusion, those experiences um, that, that can happen on an inclusive playground early on in life, exposure to disability, those interactions, coming to expect the presence of disability, how that can carry forward into adulthood. Um, I, I, I just want, I, I hope people appreciate that, what, what it can contribute in the long run, you know, acknowledging that societal and institutional change is so darn slow sometimes. Um, you know, obviously excluding some children from these spaces on the basis of disability has been normal for decades and is just plain wrong. Um, and, and creating those changes can have, uh, long-term significance in terms of, you know, the, the, the type of society that we, we sustain and desire down the road. Thank you, Tim. And Jen or Kelly, Kelly. Maybe I could jump in, but <laughs> I hope I don't take any of your thoughts. Um, you know, when I, I teach a, a required course called the Adapted Physical Activity Course, um, and, and we, we talk a lot about accessibility and inclusion in that course. And what I say to my students, like, and similar to what you know, Tim's saying, you know, it, it, it takes a really long time in terms of changing, let's say, the, the infrastructure, the built environment, getting the money to get that 15,000 square foot playground. Um, but I think what we can have a more immediate change in terms of social environment, and it goes back in terms of that sense of belonging and inclusion. So I think they go hand in hand. We think about the physical and social environment, um, but we, we need to think about both. And really, um, that's where we can, can look to resources or whatnot, um, making, you know, having everyone that comes to one space feels like they belong. And obviously, over time, the, the built environment needs to be changed but I think that the, the, the social can go a long way if we don't have that then there's a challenge now having said that even you know the research that we've been doing um where we're seeing that there are you know these uh playgrounds are designed for uh, to be accessible and inclusive it's a foundation but still if the social environment isn't there you still are dealing with negative attitudes then that doesn't have that sense of inclusion so they physical and social go hand in hand and we can look at both and what what is it within our means immediately and what may be more long-term. Thank you, Kelly. Um, those are both really good comments and I think hopefully mine builds on that a little bit. Just really thinking that ideally we get to a point where everybody in the community feels the responsibility for inclusion. That if you know, your city, your municipality puts in a new playground and it's not accessible that everybody is saying, whoa, whoa, why is this new playground not accessible for all kids in our neighborhood? And that is hard to get to. It's really hard to get folks not connected to the disability experience to be thinking about it on a regular basis. So I think that's our challenge for everyone, you know, on this presentation today is really to make that a part of all of our conversations and all of our discussions about playgrounds is why why is that not our standard that every playground is fully accessible um, for all kids? And then that would permeate then to kids being able to participate in recess with their peers or being invited to playgrounds or just being able to go down to their neighborhood playground and participate with the other neighborhood kids. So really shifting that, that burden of, of inclusion and access to spread it out to everyone so that we can work together to make sure that that's a priority for, for all of our communities. You know, I really uh, appreciate these these thoughts um, about the social and the physical and that the burden not be individualized to those that have the experience of childhood disability in in and of, in themselves or in their families or or even in their extended families. Um, and and I wonder I wonder about this part. So to create that feeling of social responsibility, um, you know, to, to want to know why something isn't inclusive or to demand change when something ought to be inclusive. Um, I do, I do wonder about, um, the playbook a little bit. I just, I just wonder, is it, so when I, when I was introducing, you know, I said that there's recommendations, there's strategies. Do you feel as though that an audience member, a family member, that they would find 
uh, information that could help them to be thinking maybe even beyond their own experience. So as we know, disability um, impacts families differently, individuals differently. Would you say that that's a great resource um, for people to be exploring if they want to think about even what's outside of my own experience that that is important for inclusion? Might be a little biased, but yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I will note, I think that the the structure of the playbook that, is, you know, around those four key questions that are largely experience oriented, I, I think that kind of, you know, creates that context for anybody reading to start gaining some insight into um, the experiences of gaining access, of gaining access, the that unrecognized access work that is often involved. Jen, you were mentioning that, you know, with, with um, addressing the, the, the trying to mitigate having people living with disability to take on all of that work and acknowledging that, you know, we, we need to do more on that front. So, and, and just learning about uh, some of the community engagement activities, the different types of equipment, uh, you know, the details on the surfacing and even the importance of, you know, the surrounding environments and services and maintenance. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive report. Um, I, I think it will give a lot of insight. Thank you, Tim. Um, now, what I would like to do is uh, put up the QR codes so that uh, all of you in the audience can access these resources that we've talked about. Um, there's the playbook link, but also you'll be able to um, link to the resources specifically that Kelly and Jen talked about as well. So here we go. I'm just going to put it up. Hopefully you're gonna tell me that it's working. That's always what we're looking for. When Zoom works, I feel like it's a successful day. Um, and as we wrap up, I really wanna thank our panelists for being here today and sharing with us your knowledge and your expertise. Really, it was a truly interesting conversation that has for myself encouraged me to reflect on these initial experiences of, of play. How is it that they can lead us to the potential of being more used to an inclusive society. I think that piece has been important. And how is it that we can think about inclusion as a shared responsibility, a communal responsibility, and to acknowledge that the, the physical accessibility is not the only important factor when we think about inclusion and in play. Um, I will say I'm also very excited to hear about play leaders and specific training for inclusion. So I hope that everyone's had a chance to access these QR codes. And I'll just take a minute now to say thank you so much to our panelists. Um, thank you to our audience for being here with us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the BRI symposium this afternoon. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tali. Thanks, everyone.